Um, so thank you, GetLinked. Hi, good day. Um, for hosting us tonight. Uh, this is a wonderful venue. Uh, and I hand over to Reshma to say a few things. I think let's get the speakers to sit down first. It's like they're standing. Why don't we just sit? I'll just, yeah, very quickly. Michael, have a seat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have a seat. No, <laughs> you can if you want to, so that everyone can know who you are and you know, kind of put a name to the face with the name kind of face. Line, line up according to the face. Uh. I'm uh, not sure. I think it was there, right? Eh? Not, not, not really. Not yeah, go ahead. Do your thing. I suppose okay. it's here. Hey, we're just keeping well, soap names. Yeah. So, okay. very quickly. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Very quickly, my name is Reshma, so we're actually from GitLinks, we're Asia's largest tech talent um, platform. The reason why we're collaborating with women who code, coding girls, a JS conference, iOS conference, many other conferences around Singapore is because we realize there's a market for tech talents and all of these non-profit organizations like Women Who Code need um, help, needs assistance in terms of planning events and stuff like that. That's where we come into place. So very, very quickly, um, um, you know what? Forget the slides. It's okay, Purima. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know what? So basically, yeah, we're just a tech talent platform. It's a marketplace. Uh, if you're looking for a new role, please look out for me. I'm going to be around the whole event today, so I want to speak to some of you guys. Uh, if you are hiring, uh, a lot of you guys here today are actually leaders in your own ways, in your own team. So if you're hiring for your teams, I'm also the person to look up for. Um, and uh, we would love to connect over email, LinkedIn, etc, etc. So look up for us, okay? So good luck women who code and we would love to keep in touch. Thank you so much, guys. today, um, because you'll see, you'll see that there's a mix of people, so it's a very unusual women who code panel. Uh, so most, just so you know, most of our speakers have always been women, so it's a very unusual panel for us this day. So the reason why I wanted to do this was because there are so many amazing conferences happening in Singapore on, on a yearly basis. There's Walks Days, there's JS Conf, there's DevOps Days, there's PHP Conf, and they don't really have a lot of women speakers there. So our intent this year is to have more representation at these conferences. So I just wanted to do an intro of um, what these conferences are to the network through the organizers, as well as introduce two amazing women speakers who've spoken at local as well as international conferences. So that, you know, um, the idea is to get more women who code speak and speak, and also get a general idea about the advantages of public speaking. Um, how do you go about topic with topic selections? Um, how do you go about writing CFPs and bios? And also a few tips on talk preparation. All right. um, we have time for some Q and A in towards the end and also a little bit of networking towards the end. Um, but if you have this question that come to me, uh, please do button and ask the question away. All right, so shall we start? Okay. Wait, we could budge. <laughs> so um, probably we'll start with Reno. <laughs> I've been looking at her since then. So Reno. Um, before we get into the rabbit hole of your speaking and CFPs and bios, why do you think one should attend a conference? Hi, uh, good evening and thanks again for attending this uh, Women Who Code event. Now, I'll tell you why I started attending conferences. Like, uh, first of all, before I started speaking at conferences, I started attending conferences, right? Uh, that's the first step, like that's where I was like, okay, maybe I can also speak, I can also start speaking at conferences. I guess, like, I guess I believe a lot in networking and I guess conference is a very, very big networking event for anyone. If you're not there for some technological information, maybe not there for any brain information, but you can be there for the networking. There are amazing people throughout the world who are there. And believe me, like that strong network, you won't get anywhere else. And second, like I am a developer, I am an Android developer at Grab, and the second best thing that I look forward to 
like it it gives me a go ahead than my colleagues like if i attend a conference i get to know few more things that i usually know that i that usually my colleagues know so i get to know those few extra things and i go to my office and i show off them like hey you know i i attended this conference i know this and that i mean and that gives you a good rating in your performance appraisal so i guess that's a good enough reason to attend the conference <laughs> So you you go to a conference to learn more things. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> to to learn more things. Yeah. Network. To to network. To learn. Yeah. So uh, Michael, then what kind of topics do you normally host? Like when people are actually looking to learn and to do things. Definitely. So uh, yeah. So hi, my name is Mike Polisby. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of Vox Day Singapore. So basically, we're extremely open. Okay, you can do something technical. Uh, it could be Java, Android, Microsoft, Golang, we DevOps, and we also have a track. Actually, we have four tracks. So we have one which is non-technical, uh, which is more on agile and leadership, and it's about like the new ways of working and the new ways of doing management. You know, about being flat and that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, we do pretty much everything. And we are very, very open. So there's a lot of scope for um, people who are beginning their tech, tech journey as well as people who have been with the industry for a very really long time. Yes. Yeah. And not just you say, not just technology, project management, agile. Yeah. Um, and one fun fact is, Walkstays has this something called as Mind the Geek track, which is completely not related to your work. So any of your passion projects that you're working on, does fit exactly into the what stays here right now, the, the mind the beat track. Um, so Michael, like, um, as a PHP conf organizer, um, do conference organizers like first time speakers? Um, and why? Usually will. Um, so I, I, I run PHP conf for like the last three years and uh, for the, when we look at uh, CFP submissions. We look at the quality of, or rather, the, the subject they come about. Of course, if they have spoken before with videos and uh, or or something, it will be easier for us to evaluate them. Because the content is one thing, the presentation and the way that they deliver the the talk is another thing. So if they have videos of them having spoken at meetups or uh, at other conferences, it is, it's a lot easier for us to to evaluate. Uh, because if we don't have any of those things, it's a bit hard. Uh, I'll give an example. You know, say like two years ago, we did a conference. We uh, I got we had this guy who was uh, really good. Uh, his topic was really interesting. He was like quite, quite flamboyant about it and everything. Uh, I I made a mistake of not watching any of his past videos uh, before he came. So he, he came to Singapore and spoke. He had very strong uh, English accent, or was it a Scottish accent? I can't remember what it was, but it was so strong it was very hard to. It's, see, you know, it's a bit hard to, to, to cut grass what you actually say. I, I think he spoke very well, I mean in terms of the content and all that. Uh, but in terms of the delivery of the content was a bit uh, harder for the, for the crowd, especially Asian the crowd was not used to his accent to kind of like understand what he said. So uh, I thought it was a pity because I think what he was delivering, uh, the topic he was delivering was pretty interesting. Yeah, so, but as for first time speakers, I think uh, at every conference there's always uh, going to be a, a section for lightning talks. So as in, especially my conference, we do have a lightning talk section on both days, and we do encourage new first time speakers or even uh, people who are totally new to this to kind of speak there. And we try to find people who have maybe not really. I mean, usually when we ask for CF, CFPs, we also ask them to include like what they, what they think is the the level, like is it, is it is it beginner level, intermediate level, advanced level kind of stuff. And they will ask us to select whether you want to do this as a lightning talk or a uh, or a, as a full talk. So if they are going to do a lightning talk, chances are we'll actually select you. The chance of us selecting you is higher because we are always in a shortage of like because uh, speakers who fly out halfway around the world wouldn't want to just come here and speak for fifteen minutes. They want to spend at least half an hour, forty five minutes talking at the conference. So it's easier for first time speakers to actually get a slot in, in that. So I would encourage you to try when you do submit your CFPs, um, try both. Try, uh, submit for both the uh, longer extended talks as well as uh, a shorter version. Yeah. 
And of course, you have spoken before at meetups, uh, where we, and Genius actually has recorded you. Yes. <laughs> but but uh, we, we can we can never be used as a, as, a, as a resource and link in your CFP submission. Yeah. Would you like to add something? Um, yeah, but I think also as a first time speaker, like Michael said, uh, it really helps to talk at uh, meetups before. It really helps to, to um, you know, get used to talking in front of a crowd. Even though the first conference you'll think like, oh my god, this time this is not just like a small venue, it's going to be a, a conference room or something. But actually when you arrive, you found out the conference room is a lot smaller than you thought. <laughs> and and you, you, all those nerves fall away because you did talk uh, at several meetups before, so that really helps. Yeah. So, um, question for Bridget. Um, so, why public speaking? So, what do you think are the advantages of public speaking? And um, has it helped your career? Um, I think definitely has helped my career, uh, public speaking. In fact, it, but it wasn't something that I set up to do. Uh, I actually did a lot of writing on my own blog. Um, also, not for the reasons that you expect. Basically, uh, I wanted to leave my first company and I was like, I wrote all this code, but I can't bring it out. I'm just gonna masquerade it as like a blog post, so a sneaky way. But, um, so I started writing a lot on the blog and eventually, um, I'm not sure if anybody here knows who she is. Uh, I met Sayani, um, Michael knows her, she's a very established member of the Singapore tech community and she was the one who kept pushing me to uh, talk about some of the articles that I wrote and that's when I started. So for me public speaking is, uh, I'm just going to admit this out loud, as a chief Asian person I think conferences are very expensive and uh, I would rather go on stage and speak uh, for free to get into the conference for free uh, than to uh, pay for a ticket because I'm a cheap Asian person. So, so yeah, uh, but, but on the serious side, I think public speaking has helped in my career because uh, usually at conferences they are videos of the talks. So it's like an opportunity for you to showcase what you know. Uh, but and also because public speaking uh, on a stage is also a showcase not only of your technical skill but your ability to communicate. And these are two things that I think will help you when you're looking for a new job or help you in your existing job. And so, yeah, I think public, there is value in, in public speaking. Uh, I, I know generally in Asia, around this region, we don't do it, do it as much uh, as our Western counterparts, but I, I think it's something that we can ease into, like moving forward. And um, I heard one of my friends share that especially when you want to give a talk, you over prepare so much that you become an expert in that particular topic. So <laughs> probably that's one of the advantages actually for me. Um, public speaking is great. I mean, getting on the stage, it's it's thrilling. Yeah. But how do you get over the fear of of getting started? From you know? Um fear of public speaking. Right. I guess, uh, well, to be honest, like I never had this big fear of public speaking. I have been speaking at stage like since I was in school, I was in high school and college. But I have seen people who have this fear and this blocks them to get on the stage and share what they exactly know. And they know it better than many other people who are on the stage. So there's this friend of mine like who's struggling with this public stage fear. And what I always tell her is that start with small like for example what is this this is exactly a same set of what we have in a meeting room right like there are a few people and i'm presenting some idea to my team so just imagine that you're doing the same thing on a little bigger scale so start speaking maybe uh, start taking up ideas inside your team start sharing your ideas inside the team Treat it as you are speaking on the stage. Then start with the local meetup groups. Like I started here in Singapore with women who code, girls who code, and there are many other meetups like that. So start small, start from where you work, where you work every day. That's the great platform to work on, believe me. And then the local meetups, and eventually you'll get over it. I think that's the best way to start it, in my opinion. Any more thoughts, Michael? Michael, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, a few things. Uh, one, uh, I'm actually not a very good public speaker. 
Uh, so what I try to do is I try to look for people who are nodding their heads as a way of like yes, hello, hi, thank you. <laughs> it's very encouraging to me to find someone affirm affirm me uh, for what I what I say. So that so you look you gravitate to worse people or look at people uh, people who are kind of like uh, helpful in terms of encouraging you that, 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 or they are responding to you. I, I did one time speaking uh, remotely to like a, a crowd in Philippines. So in Singapore, I was speaking to the Philippines. It was just via like Skype, and like I have no eye contact with anyone whatsoever. So I was like speaking to vacuum. I felt I felt very nervous. But uh, if speaking in a room like this, uh, having eye contact with some people does help a little bit. Um, I think another way thing you could try to do is. As writing a blog post would be interesting as a way of like f first formalizing your thoughts so that then just reciting them out as a way of like practicing going through the muscle memory of like say what you're supposed to say right and sometimes um, here's a little trick a lot, of, uh, a lot of speakers actually have what they call presenter notes so essentially your presenter notes are kind of like I know at least one speaker will use verbatim whatever they type into the presenter notes are actually what they will say Right, um, but it's more like a more like a leading factor to help them lead, lead them to the next point they're trying to raise. Cause because sometimes when you have a very short period time period to kind of uh, present some ideas, um, it's important to kind of be concise and be sure about what you want to say. And sometimes having to invent uh, sentences like what I'm doing right now is not easy. <laughs> so being able to construct proper sentences when you're nervous and everything is, is not easy. So basically, being able to write everything down in the presented notes, of course, it takes a bit of practice. Uh, I, I made a mistake of, of rewriting an entire presentation slide before I talked before. Uh, I think I did a good job rewriting it because it, 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 was, it improved the flow, but it made me a lot nervous because now I got to like read everything off the screen. So yeah, um, I wouldn't want to go, well, I really don't encourage everyone going through rewriting stuff on the fly, but uh, preparing everything on beforehand is helpful. Presenter slides are very helpful. You just read through them. Uh, so as as long as you practice a few times, you, you roughly know what 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 should be the next point, and you you have less reliance on 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 on, on less watching a screen, right? So uh, yeah. So these are a few tips I would, I would give. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like a lot of the like DevOps days, for example, speakers come. They actually ask to do a meetup first. Uh, to do actually like a rehearsal of the talk they're going to do at the conference. That's a good thing uh, to do as well. Um, in terms, like when I started, so I at school hated speaking in front of people, absolutely hated it. And um, then because of my work, I had to give training to people. So then I told myself because my boss believes I can do it, I guess I can do it. So I, I started giving training to people. And after that, um, Speaking at our meetups really helped me to p pick up some new technology that I want. I didn't get the opportunity to learn at work, so I was like, I really want to learn about this. But the best way I found after teaching uh, other people is the questions that they ask me. So because if I sit in front of a manual and I try to read, I don't get that other perspective. Sometimes I mean I was training uh, financial systems and I didn't know anything about debits or credits or anything else. So it actually the questions they're asking me about how to do things made me understand a lot more about the material. So even when I started, I, I did um, financial implementations, uh, financial systems implementations. When I started moving towards DevOps, I actually started learning about server maintenance and server ops. And I went to Meetup and I said, look, this is a new framework. Nobody really knows how it works, but I spent a week or two learning about it, watching a lot of material about it. And I started to repeat like what I learned about it. And then people started asking questions like, how do I do uh, server maintenance? How do I take one of the servers down? It's like, oh, you do that? <laughs> okay, uh, so let me think about that. And, and I learned a lot more and looked, uh, learned where to ask like what to do. So yeah, um, and then in terms of nerves, because then you go in front of people that know a lot more. Um, I just told myself it's for free, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, after you've gotten over the fear and you want to do it this year, I want to speak at a conference. What do you speak about? Like, let's say, um, let's say I want to uh, speak at Vox Days, my group. So, um, do you? Can you suggest some big nerd topics to the audience? Or um, even like, let's say I'm a newbie or an expert in the industry for, for working for years, but 
Like, would people be interested in what I have to say? Uh, well, it's hard to say because for us we are very open about the topic, but of course, like, uh, uh, actually we did some statistics uh, based on last year's uh, conference. So we didn't share the ratings, but we actually had some internal ratings for all, all the speakers. Okay. And we tried to actually find the pattern. What kind of people do people like the most? Uh, actually, if you do a talk with only slides, you really have to be super good to keep people engaged. Or maybe you have to ask questions and throw them chocolates or something like this. But you need to find something to keep people engaged because people will listen to you for one minute and then they will think, think about something else. And that's just how it is. So if you do demos, if you make jokes, if you ask questions to the audience, that kind of stuff, uh, you're much more likely to keep their attention. And sometimes the best rated talks are actually not the most complicated ones. You know, but if you know how to connect with the audience, then it will be a strong plus for you. So you don't need complicated topics? Is no, topic. don't try, especially for your first talk, don't try with the hardest topic, like uh, artificial intelligence. In <laughs> and, uh, and also one thing I wanted to add, uh, so you know we are all friends and there are conferences and meetups everywhere in the world. So once finally you reach that goal that you are able to do one topic, no matter what it is, please recycle it, okay? Like, even like if you go on holidays in the Philippines, for example, there will be a meetup who will be very happy to host you as international speaker, okay? So it's also a very nice way to connect with local communities. Can I add on to something? Uh, so about speaking about a complex topic or a simpler topic. So I attended Google I.O. last year and they did a very simple topic presentation. Imagine in a Google I.O. where like the Google I.O. is 1500 SGP. So if people are going to Google I.O. to hear about a very simple topic and that was Android Studio Profiling. Very basic, very, very basic. Like every Android developer would know that. They did a presentation about that and I was like, whoa, like I was interested in that because I didn't know. And even though I was doing Android development for like five years plus. So I was like, okay, I'll do the same talk. I prepared the talk and as Michael said, like you should recycle it. I gave the same talk on three different in three different countries. And when I did the talk in Russia, I we also got the rating. Like, okay, like how many people like your talk? Two out of ten people said, uh, you are an international speaker, you could have done better, you could have done a complex topic. But believe me, seven out of those ten people said that we can relate to your problem yeah. and we learned a lot from your problem and we got a direction to improve our application. So I guess it was worth it, like the simple topic was worth it. That's awesome. One more thing about simple topics, like uh, you cannot go to a conference and expect the whole audience to be at a very high experience level. So even when you do a maybe, like I, I tend to go in deep technical topics and I try to fill out the audience, most of the time people haven't like used the technology or haven't done the things and I realize they won't be able to follow and I have to do a lot of introductory. So complex topics are really hard unless you have the right audience for it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what do you do? How do you go about selecting a topic for a conference? Well, I think it's important if you're going to be speaking about a topic on stage in front of a lot of people is that you yourself have to be interested in that topic itself because the audience can tell. The audience can tell if you're nervous, the audience can tell if you do, you're unsure of yourself and most, like 90% of conferences, the audience are not hostile to you. I, I've had friends who had bad experiences but those were like they know it's an outlier experience most people in the audience they, they, they don't want to see you fail I mean they did pay good money to see you so <laughs> I don't think it's in their best interest for you to fail either so most of the time the audience is pretty much rooting for you so I think that helps um, pertaining to the previous question about nerves but in terms of topic um, I think whether it's complex or simple it's important that you yourself are interested in it so I mean, there are some conferences that do specify like, oh, we like talks about this topic, X topic, Y topic. But if you yourself don't aren't interested in that topic, I, I suggest not, not like just don't don't do it because it um, when you're interested in something, you have a tendency to explore a bit more and you put in a bit more effort into researching the talk or thinking about the talk, and so you will bring a perspective that a lot of other people who maybe weren't as interested in it. They, they don't have, 
So that's something new that you can bring to the table, even if it's a simple topic. So, so I think that's, that's for me, that's key, to, to have interest in a topic yourself. One really, really small thing. Um, you do, don't you always need to give a very technical talk. You could always you could also give your more of a personal sharing of your journey, learning something. You don't actually have to be like I'm not at destination yet, but here's the journey so far, right? So that's another way you could another kind of, kind of topic which people like to listen to or hear about. Oh yeah, you struggle with this. I also had the same struggle, so it's kind of like something you can relate to as well. Yeah. So let's do something different now. So uh, we're all conference organizers. Um, do you want to pitch your conference? Yeah, 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 I want to. <laughs> I, I got KPI. No, I'm joking. Um, so um, I think it's up. OK, it's not there. Uh, so JSConf Asia, which is Southeast Asia's uh, biggest web development conference, is happening in June this year. I know usually we are like big, uh, end of the year. Um, logistics issues this year, we're in June. So it's June 14th to 16th. We will be at LaSalle College of Arts, and um, this is the fifth year we are having it in, in Singapore. It's three days, and even though it says JSConf, uh, we are including like design system talks, uh, CSS talks, because it's a web development conference. And so, yeah, we are, uh, our CFPs don't close for local speakers. Uh, fun fact. Um, so, if you are interested or you start have an inkling that I, I want to maybe give it a shot, for me, uh, as part of the organizing team, we, we are desperately looking for speakers who fit these three criteria. Not necessarily all three, but ideally three. The criteria is uh, local, uh, female, and not unwilling to speak. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how hard it is to meet all these three criteria, but it is. so. Um, yeah, that's my pitch. We all fit in that criteria, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we should all apply. All submit a CFP. Maybe you go first. I I organize PHP Conf Asia, so it's like the will be the fourth year we're organizing this. Um, so for for the first year and the last year, we did we organized this. We got the creator of PHP, Rasmus Ladov, to come to Singapore. So that's quite the more highlights of the show, I mean, as in for the conference, like, as in get to talk with somebody who, who actually created the language that you use for, for your for your daily day to day work. So, um, yeah, it's really, he's a very humble guy. I got to talk to him. Got to, he, he, he drives a Tesla, and then he talks about his son, you know, be taking, uh, you know, photography and a little, little electronic things that he that his son is. I love trying. how humble and Tesla came out the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, to me. Whatever. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure whether we'll get him again this year because he he wants to like alternate his, his years and everything. But yeah, but to get to meet him was uh, was quite the highlight of my career. As in, to see somebody who I owe my job to. So sometimes going for a conference uh, like uh, uh, conferences in Singapore. Sometimes in, like Red Dot Ruby conference is another one where you get to meet the guy who created Ruby. So um, it's it's going for conferences like this is also opportunity to network with people. Uh, meet people in the industry. Uh, at least I know personally I found a job because I went to a conference and spoke with somebody at the booth. La. So I got one job at least through that, so, uh, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, so you get to meet people, you get to network with people, and you get to see people from, uh, from all around the world, uh, especially Asia, because we're pitching it as a, a conference for Asians. Uh, and, and you know, uh, you get to meet people from Indonesia, from, from uh, Malaysia, and Philippines and a few others. Like if you were already doing, you were still doing PHP, or you are still, <laughs> uh, this would be a good conference to go for, and you get to meet a lot of people. Uh, of course, you get swag and free free T-shirts. Oh, and we have this. Uh, uh, last year we, we printed, a, we made a little like uh, plush, a plushy. We, we call it pearly, the the uh, elephant. So it's like an elephant with unicorn tip, and it's, uh, it's kind of cute. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we don't really have limited uh, stock to it, so yeah. Um, yes, so this year we'll, we'll try to get more of that. So if we're coming for a conference this year, which will be June, I think. We'll be announcing it soon. Not on the same day, huh? Mm -hmm. week, week after, I think. Okay, one right. or two weeks after, I believe, if I remember Just memory serves me correctly. It's one or two weeks after yours, uh, okay. so it should be okay. Um, yeah, so uh, if you, how many of you guys are actually still doing PHP? Uh, doing PHP? 
No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, in Ruby. Ruby? Ruby? Yes. Uh, Python people? Tough crowd. Tough crowd. Yeah, <laughs> Python over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Golang. Anyone go to Golang? Okay. Anyway, whatever. So yeah, PHP is one of those cool languages out there. Still cool. I think we still, we still run a lot of uh, websites around the world. I think it's it it pretty cool. Yeah, so do, do check it out, uh, phpconf.asia. Yeah. So whoever goes next has to beat the plushie and uh, all the swag. Who <laughs> 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 has to speak more about their conference and why should we speak at what states? Oh. Yeah, I can try. Uh, first of all, like, uh, so I understand you guys don't use Python, PHP, Ruby, so what do you use? Python. You use Python, okay. Someone uses Java? Java. 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 Who is it? JavaScript. Thanks, thanks guys. Okay. <laughs> .NET, maybe? Okay, so mostly Java, JavaScript. Uh, okay, so Vox says maybe I can tell you the story of why we've been doing it, because we are all volunteers, we don't get paid for that, so we do it on a, as a side activity. Uh, well, you can be working for a bank, for a startup, and so on, and you use a lot of open source products. I mean, they're not really products because they're open source, and maybe you have no idea where they come from. You know, like maybe imagine that people do it on their free time, maybe they get paid for it, and but you're still using it every day. And if you're a Java developer, like Spring, for example, is or Hibernate are a big part of your day. So this conference came from the fact that we realized a lot of people didn't know where their tools came from. So we said let's bring those people, the, the founders of those tools, to Singapore. And uh, so, for example, like uh, this year in Vox Days, so if you do Java, we have the founder of Spring who is going to come to, uh, the, to Singapore. If you do continuous integration, how many of you guys use Jenkins? So we have the creator of Jenkins who is to come, going to come to Singapore as well. Uh, we have the lead of Groovy, Groovy language, you might know Groovy, who is also going to come, and quite a lot more people. So, the idea is really to make you guys meet with the people behind uh, the open source projects, basically. And of course, that's for the plenary session, that's the big room, but we have smaller rooms where you guys can speak as well. So, so yeah, that's a lot. And why should we speak at DevOps days? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, I just organized DevOps Days for the first time last year. I mean, co-organized because the team behind it, uh, Sergio and Stefan, they organized it like three, I think three or four years already. And um, yeah, DevOps Days, again, for me, because I'm doing uh, site reliability engineer or DevOps uh, now, uh, it really was for the networking. That's why, like I think everybody said earlier, you should meet the people that are there. We try to get also the international speakers to come to DevOps Days and each year we have to select a theme. Um, this year we haven't started with the theme yet, but the conference will happen in November, so we still have some time. Um, normally it's around November or October. But DevOps days, because we absolutely have 100%, I think we had no women speak. Oh no, we had one. Uh, Isha. Uh, she was oh yeah, we had two. She was, uh, she's a networking, yeah. She yeah. gave a lightning talk. Yeah, she has there. a lightning she's talk. All right. Hey, Isha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hey. Uh, but it, it, that was actually my mission objective to get more, and it was really hard. It was really hard. So, <laughs> um, so that's why uh, we should go. Uh, do, yeah, yes. That's why we have this yeah. talk. So. Oh, I also have a bit. Okay, please, please. sorry. <laughs> I'm not organizing any conference, but let's me and you. Let's put CFPs to all these conferences. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> and not to forget, Connect Asia. Yeah, oh yeah. Actually, she already like did vision for that, but Connect Asia that's happening on 31st of August. So let's do it. Awesome. Um, so now let's talk about the core part, like CFPs and bios. How do, how do we go about it? Like, it, it is. I mean, um, that's how your, your talk gets selected, right? I mean, uh, through organizers. So, Michael, so what would you look for as an organizer in a CFP? Um, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, think of many, as many ideas as you can and submit as many as you can. Because sometimes we kind of like, oh, we like this person, his pro uh, person's profile, um, but, the top, uh, but the top, he only submitted one topic and there's no, no other topics that 
uh, we could select from this uh, from this person. So what we like are people who has multi multiple uh, submissions. Then because you have like you have some te highly technical ones, not so technical ones, and like you know sh personal sharings and whatnot. Then we gotta like figure out which is the right uh, thing that fits the overall teams. And when we are looking at when we're selecting speakers, we also look at the overall team of like who, uh, what would be covered by this. So usually there will be more than one person submitting the same topic, uh, like say on on, on on a particular framework or a particular tool. There will be people, multiple, multiple people submitting the same thing. So sometimes you want to think about, okay, this person is, I think he's well known for this. He should, we should get to talk about that. And the other person, oh, she also submitted something similar. Um, what do we do now? Uh, does this person have some other topic that uh, that, that they, they they'd like to talk about? And then we can, can make a deviation. And say, okay, maybe you may want to talk about this instead for this conference. So that's what kind of like what we like to to see uh, more 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 variety of topics. Um, I know of at least one friend who actually like just shoots a lot of CFPs and they actually starts panicking when the one that's uh, only when he, he gets selected. <laughs> and see, he, 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 he has not prepared the slides or anything yet. So he's just waiting for like see which of the CFPs get. He, got, he knows he has enough material to talk about anything. So he just submitted quite a lot of topics. And it's like, oh, one, the one that got selected, ah, okay, now I gotta like sweat like crazy to prepare the slides for that one. So it's okay, just cut the submit as many as you can. And you know, just take and then take worry about preparing the actual slides or, or, or content much later. What you really do want to uh, give, uh, for example, would be like an overall view, overview of like what you want to talk about. Uh, your title should be try to keep your title short and descriptive, uh, short and and sweet, not too not too long, because sometimes it's too long, it can't fit into a YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, YouTube has a limitation how long the the, yeah. the, the the title of the video of the of the talk is, um, and uh, in your in your description, try to be uh, say as much as you can about it as you give an overview like what what are the, what are the uh, bullet points. I think bullet points would be quite interesting because I really I find it very hard sometimes to read through like paragraphs and paragraphs of, of data. Uh, but you just summarize your thoughts into bullet points, and uh, sometimes you might also want to include. Uh, Information about like where you've spoken about this before, which we type you've spoken because, because that will show us that we have a track record of sp speaking publicly. Uh, and they, their videos you get attached to in your because usually like at least for the CFPs that we that we use, uh, we there's a title description and then the additional information about uh, that you like us to know about. So that any other information would be good to us. Just throw all those links in there links to your slides that you have been prepared before or other talks that you've spoken about similarly something either something similar to that what you, what you submitted submitting about or at least something that, that shows that you have spoken before um in your personal profile just just be as uh, as candid as you can about what you've done you it's good it's nice to just always prepare have that handy uh one two paragraph self introduction about yourself would be very nice uh, photo is optional, but we don't really uh, we don't penalize you if you don't have a photo at all. Um, although, um, yeah. So and then uh, videos of uh, uh, as I say, videos of of, of, of talks you've given in the past will give us a good a good um, sense of how well spoken you are, how well you can present your ideas, and how articulate you are. Um, yeah. So these are so at least some of the things that I look out for when I'm selecting. So don't do uh, yeah. So many, so many, so many as you can. say we we look at the spread of speakers and topics, and we've kind of like figure out what's the best uh, for each one. Yeah. I, I really like the idea of bullet points. Maybe we should try that. Yeah. We yeah. can try like twenty paragraphs. Um, I think it's important to realize that when it's an open CFP, the organizers get a lot of entries, uh, mostly from like. Western country white guys who want to score a ticket to an exotic location in Asia. And I'm saying this. Uh, I'm saying this from the uh, perspective of the JS Conf submissions that we got, and trying to sift through all that to find like people who hit the criteria. The very simple three criteria that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. So um, usually bullet points are good, and I think within the bullet crafting those bullet points actually helps you figure out exactly whether this is something that you are prepared to stand on stage to talk about. So that's a, like a double helpful thing. But it also allows, it also makes, forces you to be more concise about what 
exactly <laughs> stands out about your topic, especially if you're picking a topic that is relatively uh, common, that is very popular, that you know a lot of people are gonna gonna submit. It's a, a chance for you to, if you have chosen that particular topic, to differentiate. But like, why is your why why you're speaking about X is different from everybody else? Because some submissions we've we have, we have seen, I, I, I guess. CFP is like going for a job interview. You, you, it's not an accurate representation of who you really are because it's too short. Yes. But that's how it works, right? So we've gotten submissions that look as if someone just copied and pasted some of the documentation. They're like, well, yeah, mm, you just told us what we knew about this thing from the documentation. They're like, meh, nah. So, so I think that's something to, to think about. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of effort and um, yeah, you're not getting, it's not like, it's not your, it's not as if you're getting paid a salary to write CFPs. But I mean, if, if you get accepted, it's like free ticket to conference, so you know, uh, just saying, it's, 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 it's worth the effort. And it also, I think it also helps you to, to sort of, even if you don't end up giving a talk, you have to spend a bit of time to find out more about the topic. I think that's kind of helpful from a knowledge perspective, you know, justify doing this. Yes, that's how I justify it. Yeah, sometimes um, CFP makes me like, I, I, I want to talk about this or I want to do something about it, but just haven't found the chance yet. But then a CFP helps me put this all down, like what I want to do. And then if it gets selected, I actually get down to do it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Forces you to do something. Yeah. And maybe Michael, you want to share? Yeah, <coughs> sorry, just something quick. Uh, if you have a friend or a colleague who would like to submit with you, uh, at least for us, for Hot Days, we like a lot when we have. Uh, co-speakers, you know, like two speakers coming together. Uh, so it relieves a lot of the stress. And it's also very much more interactive. So in the same way when you're submitting for your CFP, for your call for papers, uh, you can also actually do a submission for two people. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah. You have to find the co-speaker first who can <laughs> share the stage with you and have the same kind of nerves. Um, Renu, I know that you have a really cool um, way to create distinctive CFPs, something that you shared with me, could you share with the audience as well? Oh, um, although I have, uh, telling the mistakes which these guys pointed out, I have blasted the same kind of paragraphs to multiple conferences and from one conference I got the same reply which she pointed out that mm, how is your talk different than the others, like what are you going to talk about which is not in the documentation. So I had to explain and then, uh, and it didn't get selected, so <laughs> that set apart. Uh, I mean, I try to be creative in uh, CFP titles. Like, in my opinion, that's the first impression uh, organizers, organizers will get. So what Punima was talking about, so there's this new uh, topic that I want to talk about in upcoming conferences. It's called, um, okay, what is it called? It's app size bundle, <laughs> sorry. It's called uh, some app size bundle. It's a new thing from Google that, uh, you can release your Android apps in multi, uh, multiple APKs in smaller, smaller chunks. So uh, my CFP title is app size and I prefer smaller size. So that's my <laughs> CFP title is. Yeah. So, yeah. so I believe that CFP title should be interesting. So catchy CFP titles. <laughs> um, as conference organizers, um, do you all provide assistance to, uh, let, let's say that somebody submitted a CFP and you know that that person is a first time speaker. Um, do you all provide, like, is there some amount of back and forth that you guys could do? Uh, and something to plug. And so one of the things that we are doing uh, in conjunction with uh, conferences, this was started last year, it's called Global Diversity CFP Day. Uh, it was an initiative that came out of, I think, organizers of a conference called Scotland JS, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. But what happened is that it's a coordinated effort globally, global wide. 2nd of March, uh, this year 2nd of March. We did it what, the, for the first time last year where every uh, country has a volunteer mm, organizer and it's to encourage local speakers to submit to CFPs. Basically what those organizers, uh, were, they were finding difficulty get, coming up with more diverse lineup because their lineups usually are uh, male, young, white guy. That's, that's a very common demographic. 
So in a in a bid to sort of increase the di diversity of the speaker lineups, they came up with this initiative. So we're doing it again this year. So this year, March, second of March 2019, it's a Saturday. So we are also doing it. And I think so far there's a bit about like 110 locations around the world who have like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this. And so what, what's gonna happen there is that they're they're gonna be we're gonna give advice on like how to craft your CFP. Um, public speaking tips in terms of like presentation, like how do you prepare, uh, and, and some discussions that we call for, for the Singapore chapter. So it's run by um, myself and uh, also Thomas will be there, um, organizer of JSCon. Uh, I don't know if I can harass any of the other organizers <laughs> who wanna wanna come. That's, that would be great also. But the, the plan is to sort of help people with uh, the CFPs and sort of like answer any questions or any doubts that they may have. So this is something that's probably going to happen like EOD uh, moving forward. But for this year, it's 2nd of March, so that's my shameless plug. No one else. The link is on the Women Who Code Facebook, so join us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, um, I know, uh, <laughs> next, next, yeah. So Michael, I know that uh, last year for PHP Con, you did something really cool from a diversity perspective. So would you like to share? Uh, yeah, we actually I learned this from Thomas. He, 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 we basically offered this thing called a diversity ticket. Uh, so he, he essentially, you could apply for, for this uh, diversity ticket. We, we, and uh, we think that you qualify. And we, we, we see, if we see that you qualify for it, uh, we'll give you either a free ticket to the conference. Uh, in one particular case, we uh, in one particular case we actually even paid for uh, her lodging as well as I think half of her flight uh, her flight ticket to Singapore. Uh, she's she's from uh, India. I yeah. think we met her before. Yeah, uh, yeah she's a uh, she. Uh, of course, when we ask, uh, is it is simple? Uh, Google form you fill up. We ask about your profile, what you do, why why would you think you you. Deserve this diversity ticket. Uh, what do you think? How? What do you, how do you think you qualify for it? Um, and we just look through it, and then we and we feel that you have a if you have an interesting background and you, you really fit the profile of, uh, of a person uh, who will benefit from such a such a thing, and we will, we will provide you a free ticket. We actually gave out a number of those uh, free tickets, uh, in, uh, at least for those who apply for it from Singapore. We gave out quite a number of them. Uh, and uh, she was the only one that we kind of threw yeah. in as well. And for speakers in general, um, uh, you get free ticket to the conference. That's a that's a given. Uh, in my conference, at least, uh, we pay for the lodging. So we, we, the hotel where you're staying at for the days of the conference, you is fully paid for by us. And if you do need uh, a subsidy to pay for your flight, uh, we will look at it on a case by case basis. Uh, and we even offer you a grant. Uh, and usually the grant that we give again is about up to fifty percent of the flight, uh, flight ticket out. So depending on where you're from, uh, yeah, there are some there are some that we really can't uh, really can't fly them in because it's like way too expensive to like around from where uh, Russia or something. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but um, yeah, so it's some things we do. We also, I think another way you could also uh, go for conferences is to actually come out as a volunteer. So if you volunteer at a conference, you get to also meet speakers. You then can also talk to them and actually learn from them as well. You know, it, and it's a good way to get free access to the to conference. Another way, uh, very it's a minority, but it also requires you to do, do a lot of work. Is to have volunteer with us and on engineers.sg. So <laughs> yeah, so you do we do get uh, we do get uh, free access to some to the conferences that we're recording. And sometimes we, uh, it's really required because we really, we, uh, it's really hard work just to sit there and just record like what we're going to do right now. So yeah, imagine that times eight hours, right? So yeah, it's not that easy. So I think it's also another one there. Yeah, so um, yeah, volunteering at conferences is also another way just to also even get to know about the, the speakers and even pick their brains, like well, what do you think about this thing? You know, it's a good way to also to see how they how to observe the speakers as they prepare for their talks. So it's a, sometimes we go through some rituals and whatnot. So um, it's also a good way to also uh, see see up close. That's 
Awesome. Um, so I can vouch for engineers as SG as well. Yeah. So you get to be uh, with the cool gadgets and walk into a conference and have like front row seats. It is hard work though. <laughs> it is, definitely. Um, so we've selected a topic. Uh, we've drafted our CFPs. Um, now what? Actually presenting on stage. So Udinson, in your experience, have you like blanked out completely on the stage while giving a talk? And what did you do to get up? I definitely blanked out. Like, um, yeah, I don't know how I got out of it. <laughs> um, I think what helps, though, I mean, if you are, if you have rehearsed your talk a lot of times, um, you will be able to get get out of uh, a blackout. If, if actually the, the moments I blank out is basically because I haven't prepared enough. <laughs> it's usually that's the case. Uh, but yeah, uh, but yeah, nerves. I don't know what else to say. I mean. <laughs> Uh, personally, I have not blanked out before, and, and I agree with you guys because uh, you, you practice a lot before. And um, for me, I've been very lucky. The first uh, conference that I gave a full length talk on was an international one where people like flew me in. And uh, because of that, I felt an extra responsibility to sort of do a good job. Because uh, like, if, like, if you, people spend money to bring you in and then you bomb, right? It's like, wow, no ROI at all. What a wasted investment, they never ask me back ever again. So that's that. So, and because of that, and this was about 2017 when I first started speaking. So what I do is I give the talk as though I would be standing on stage, like right? just, just at home, you know, like walking around, but like stand up and, and sort of with the clicker, uh, also, pro tip, always use a clicker. Like, pressing space bar on your key unless you're doing live coding is like, mm -hmm. So like, the, the clicker makes things, uh, makes it, cause it makes you free to walk around, so it's more natural. But the, the thing is, rehearse as if you would be on stage. Like, going, going through your, your, your talk in your mind is not good enough. Because it's different if you have to speak out loud. So you have to sort of do it, at, do it as though it's the real thing. It's, I remember very early on, um, I, I met this uh, lady, she works at Mozilla, she's called Sandra Percy. She, she mentioned something that, that I thought really made a lot of sense, that even though you think of it as public speaking, right, it's, it's a performance. You, you are on stage and you're performing for an audience. So like, even Beyonce, you know, before Beyonce does all her fantastic things, she, she's practiced for hours. The exact same moves, the exact same songs she would do on a Super Bowl stage. Like, she has gone through the motions. So there's no reason why as a public speaker you don't go through the exact same motions when you rehearse. And I think if you do that enough times, even if you like sway sway somehow just blank out, right? There's something called muscle memory. And and, and like Michael mentioned earlier, you can always fall back on speaker notes to sort of like jog you back. You won't like completely just I don't know what my name is. Like no, <laughs> not not really. You, you have speaker notes there to sort of like bring you like anchor you back. So I think that's 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 what yeah. Be uh, yeah, speak it out. Here's a little secret. Um, very, um, a lot of the speakers, international speakers I know of, right? uh, chances are they're just a one horse pony, isn't they? Uh, <laughs> they <laughs> <laughs> no, rather, okay, there's a, there's a kind of. Uh, it's a one horse pony. As in one trip pony, sorry, one trip pony. Sorry. Yeah, so there's they have only one talk. One talk, talk topic and they just keep recycling over yes. and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, one very memorable example was Ken Bex. Do you know who Ken Bex is? Yes, yeah. The guy who wrote the uh, XP, uh, no, sorry, yeah. uh, test, test Room Development and all that stuff. And actually programming. Uh, I heard him speak in Singapore like six years ago or something, five or six years ago. He was about um, ease at work, yeah. having the ease at work. And then uh, I felt well, I was really inspired by his, by that talk. Um, and then I wanted to see him speak again. And then there was an opportunity for me to see him speak again at the at the, at the Rails Comp in, in Atlanta. And I went there just to like you know kind of watch the other talks and also uh, watch Ken Beck's talk. Like. He was giving one of the keynotes that they that were at the conference. And it came the same topic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there were some deviations or like he had some additional examples and all that stuff. He had the same same example. It was the same talk. I was like. I knew that one. <laughs> Another example is Justin Long. Josh uh, Long. Josh Long. Um, yeah, Josh Long. 
He has the exact same jokes for all his talks. <laughs> I cannot, but they're still funny though, they're still funny. <laughs> and I watched him just talk at three other conferences and he had the same talk. Already he starts the same way and then he goes into his own usual spiel about uh, how he loves production, but you know. Uh, <laughs> <Spoiler>. <laughs> but yeah, so don't worry that you don't have a lot of ideas or whatever. Sometimes even the most popular speakers in the world, you only have one topic. Um, one topic, one speaker that I, that I admire uh, very much is uh, Sandy Metz. Sandy Metz, uh, she, she wrote quite a, quite a number of books as well. And she and I always feel very inspired by seeing her talk. It's because she will talk about a uh, very very simple thing, but she will describe it in, in such such depth and and, and and such an easy to understand uh, way that you just totally totally get it. But you only, she only has one topic that she uses and practice. She practices a lot, and she just uses that one talk for all the all the conferences, all the conferences that she applied to. And and every time you see her talk, yeah, it's the same topic, but sometimes it will be some different examples that she uses uh, at the length. Will also be will also differ based on like you know how much time she's given. Um, she was there was one she was even tell the, the person in front hey you know just be careful uh, there'll be like three hundred over slides going through you right now so like she'll be clicking through everything she has she shows code examples and she click through every single one to show the transition and all that stuff she's really really good and she only has one talk one topic that she speaks of that year but she practices a lot for the one talk right and it's really really good. Um, and she, she, even she herself doesn't deviate much from 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 her practice, uh, her practice run of, of the of the topics, or rather, every she knows what exactly what to speak when it, when the slide is up. She knows exactly what how to transition to the next slide and so on and so forth. She's so practiced, uh, she is so practiced in that uh, in that sense that if she tries to, you know, think of something on the, on the on the fly, he, she can't do it. She she like. She, there was one time I, I caught her doing this, she was like, she, she wanted to go deeper into a topic with an, another example which she didn't practice on and she, she, halfway through she changed her mind. Um, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't deviate so much from my slide or my, or my talk, I should go back to it, she went back to her, her original talk. So it's like, um, even professional speakers like her um, practice a lot and stick to their, the train of thought and the way that they, they deliver the thing. They don't, they don't really think or they don't, you know, they don't, they don't try to debate or try to think on the spot. Um, so same, same, same as uh, so basically, you know, practice. And even the most best speakers in the world, they don't. I've, I've always had this, had this, because I have this um, personal belief that whenever I speak to an audience, I want to show them, uh, show them something fresh, something new. So every time I give a talk, I'll try to like, try a different, show, talk about something different and everything. So when I, when I, when, when I, when I uh, knew about this international speakers and everything, only on one talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it is a good talk. This yeah. good, I have to admit, they, they practice a lot and, 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 and there's a lot of substance in what they, they speak about. Which Single is great. ladies is a hit no matter what year you are in. Single ladies is a hit. Okay, fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's true. Yeah. So, um, I know it's been like an hour long panel. Um, you guys must be really exhausted, but I promise one last question to Reno and Michael. So, uh, let's start with Reno. So, uh, how, how do you go about structuring your talk? Um, slides versus live coding, or a mixture of both? What's your approach? Well, personally, because whenever I attended the conference, uh, any conferences, uh, I never liked only slides better. Mm -hmm. okay. So definitely, like I couldn't go into that direction. I always like it a mix. I mean, I didn't even like uh, the full co live coding presentations because sometimes you lose the audience and like you're not sure whether they are, you know, uh, going up with you or not. So I always like it a mixed thing. Like some parts of the slides, the theory which talks about what I'm going to do next. So you talk about the theory and then you're gonna live demo it. I guess that works the best for me, at least. Yeah. Same question. <laughs> yes, same question. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, I agree exactly with what you said. So same, like if you do only live coding, sometimes people get lost. It's good to actually go back to slides and remind people what you just shown, and then you can go to the next live coding session. So a mix of both and. There are like lots of tricks to actually have some interaction interaction with the audience. Yeah. To give you some examples, uh, 
like uh, actually one thing I did a few years ago is that we were like benchmarking two different solutions. And my point was to prove that we are the trend is going to the new one. And what we did is actually a Google form where we asked people to vote and I told them I'll give you the answer, the results, at the end of the talk. So they were like waiting for the whole talk and they saw the results, which was from my expectations. So uh, just to give you some ideas of like uh, try to interact with your team, uh, I mean with your audience, try to ask questions, uh, you can do Google Forms, uh, you can do demos, you can mix with slides, whatever, it's better to convey your message. And uh, maybe the last thing as well is like always think about your talk as you need to have three important points. You know, like don't try to convey like, 20 messages at the same time. Yeah. Okay? Your talk should be flat, then you have one thing to say, then flat, one more thing, and then one more, and that's enough. Okay? So think before you actually design your talk, think about the highlights of your talk, the three points which are very important. That's, that's great advice. It's like a story that, that is dealt. If if uh, most of if those of you here do web, I think what uh, an advantage that, that we have, I think for me personally, most of my talks are CSS related and my slides are not keynote PowerPoint, I like to do them live in the browser. So the helpful part about if you uh, are doing web, right, you have the opportunity to tweak your slides uh, live. So it's like, personally my slides are HTML, CSS, JavaScript, right? so you can tweak, customize your slides, sort of make the point you're trying to get across uh, happen live on stage, that usually is quite a, a big audience hit. Um, it is not impossible to do a no slide talk, just live code, but it's a, it's a high risk, high reward situation because anything that might go wrong will always go wrong. This, you must go in with this expectation, so either you, you, you double check everything and then still expect things to go wrong, so you must have backup video. But if you can pull it off, it's a, confirm, a, a, a very big crowd pleaser because a lot of people are like, is it going to fail? Is it going to fail? And, and if you, you can get through like unscathed, it's like a huge plus. And even if something fails, right, people will still like, try to encourage you going on because it, I think everyone in the audience who will sort of understand that code will fail. And to fail in front of like 300 people, it's, it's something that people are, 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 are like, you know, they're, they're respecting for they, and they'll, they'll try to. And sometimes you'll get helpful or like, hey, you never put semicolon. Like sometimes you'll get like audience uh, uh, help. So that's sort of like interactivity also, which, which, so again, but it's a high risk, high reward. You must practice until you can type with your eyes closed with one hand. That's the, that's the amount of effort if you are going to like, really go for it and do no slides, just code. But yeah, it's, it's been done, it's been done. Uh, mere mortals like us just record. <laughs> it's a yes. recording of us <laughs> yes. writing code. So if you didn't do any live demo or anything, uh, mm. just record yourself. Screencast. Screencast, <laughs> video recording of your own. Like, it's very easy if you use a Mac, just open uh, an yeah. uh, iMovie. No, sorry, no, I'm quick, quick time. time. Yeah. Quick time, and then it's a like file, record, a uh, new, new screen recording, yeah. and you can record your entire screen. Uh, pro tip, you want to do this, uh, make sure you, re you downscale your, your screen to 720p. So that it's recorded into a very nice, so the fonts are bigger, it's nicer, easier for recording, and easier for people to see on, uh, on in the audience. So yeah, so adjust, uh, yes, 720p, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, screen recording of myself. So, and one of, the, one, of the cool, one of the cool things you can do with, with uh, screen recording is that you can fast forward, right? You can actually, you, you can actually record it and then like, put, use iMovie or whatever to speed up the yeah. thing. So, which is what, um, Ben did in one of the talk about Benjamin Tan. He was talking about Elixir and some some really cool stuff. And he and he knew that thing is going to take a long time to to do in real time. Nobody wants to watch it type, bro. Yeah, he doesn't want. No one wants to watch it type. So basically, he recorded and he fast forward. He barely sped up, sped up, sped up the video so you can see the transition uh, over time. Like that. He was doing some real screen visualization thing and how how you spawn many nodes and then then you how see how 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 many concurrent connections you can take and that stuff. So he was like. Yeah, it, takes, it took time to render, but he, or rather to, to get to that point, but basically, because it's speeded up, it was a lot, it, it was a lot, um, it's more bearable. Uh, yeah, and it's quite fun to see things fly very fast on the screen. So, yeah. Yeah, um, there are also a couple of Google presenters that they have like a, a playback tool to run in Bash, 
Um, I, yeah, there's, I don't know, I think it's Tim Hawking and Brendan Burns, they have these tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is, yeah, like you said, whatever you feel, like network. Um, so if you want to do a talk, if you can run everything on your local host, that would be the best thing. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. NPM installed feels like the last minute on conference, but oh, yeah. so just to like, I'll share the same experience like yeah. what Michael just said. Uh, I was speaking at Google I/O Extended last year, uh, giving my same Android Studio profile talk, um, and that was my first of that kind of talk, and in Google as well. Like that was again the first time, and I was pretty confident that I'm gonna rock it, and everything was great, and that was the biggest audience I was facing. Like it was around 225. Like that's the biggest audience I, I had faced at that time. And then I was like, yeah, everything is gonna great, uh, gonna go great. And then I walked up to the stage, and then slides, uh, the theory part went okay. And then I opened Android Studio. And those who do the Android development, they know, like, my Android Studio, like, it hung up on me. <laughs> and and it would open for me. And I am using Mac like 16 GB, and like I am using the best instrumentation that I could use. I couldn't connect to the network. I couldn't open the Android Studio and I couldn't do anything. And then my backup video like came to my rescue. Mm -hmm. So it happens. So I guess uh, having a backup video, it's always the same. Cool. So um, I've exhausted my list of questions. Um, so shall we go to the audience? Open the open up questions to the audience. Come on, folks. We have two seven CFPs this year. No, audience very shy. 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 You're not shy. One question. Let's start. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this is a very general uh, uh, question. So I obviously work from the HR background, and we have a lot of students in the audience when I go for conferences, right? And I realize that <laughs> students sometimes want to get inspired uh, to go into, example, coding, engineering, and stuff like that. So any, do you guys uh, mm -hmm. are open for topics like that, like how to inspire young ones to go into coding or something. So it's not very PHP or JS related, but yeah. some way, somehow, it goes back. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well. I mean, you mean like more cultural talk to yeah, how we inspire? Yeah. I think uh, at the DevOps days, uh, one of the important things that my co-organizer always highlight, because I really like technical talks, they always like, hold on, and so I have to have a lot of culture talks as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely in something like DevOps where it's supposed to be culture, right? So um, so yeah, that, that, that's really, I, I'm sure that that will, uh, will be a um, you know, viable talk there. Yeah. Uh, at the GopherCon last year, last year um, we actually got one of our colleagues to like, hey, you're learning Go for the first time, right? Why don't you try to do something and speak at a conference? And she basically did a pretty good talk and about you know how she picked up Go and, and the stuff that she did with GoLang. I think she was doing like a, a word cloud. You know, word cloud is like a, right, yeah. Basically, because she, she's doing some data science related stuff, so like, hey, why don't you do a word cloud and use Go? And she basically talked about her journey, going through the process, and I think it was quite inspiring to see like how she went from like I don't know what is Go to like oh hey I was able to like do a word cloud and, visual, and visualize it. And she went through the different problem solving uh, things that she went through, like how do you solve this, how to solve that, how to make it rotate in a certain way, and kind of like so it was quite interesting. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting. I think Elisha, some uh, Elisha Tan in one of the Ruby conferences talked about how she did, uh, how she started her uh, tech ladies and, right. and, mm -hmm. and her and her some of the things that she did, uh, she's doing in, in the community. So that's also something that people like to talk, uh, listen to. Uh, at GitCamp, you heard of GitCamp? It's GitCamp.sg. So it's like they open to any sort of topics as well. Um, so there's also uh, so something interesting as well. Uh, you can yeah. try that. There's a conference. Uh, there's also another conference in Singapore called an unconference. <laughs> yeah, an unconference is uh, basically you come you come in. There's no there's no speaking roster. There's just a timetable of like open slots, and pe pe people basically just uh, on the spot they propose a thing, and put it on the board, and people vote for them. And I think uh, in the higher higher voted, highly voted ones probably get a slot and, and, and all that stuff. So it's like very. Uh, Egalitarian, you, you, everyone's uh, give, uh, given a fair playing field as you come in, take on a topic, and if people like it, uh, or rather voted for it, it gets, it gets a slot in, uh, in, in, during the day. So that's also something you want to try for. I think, I don't know whether Pritam is going to do that again this year. Let's check. Yeah. Um, so that's another format you can try. 
De- ja, Devil's Day zo zijn. Ja, uh, ja, Devo- ja. ja. Devil's Day zo zijn. <laughs> ja, ik heb het gezegd. Oh, dat is iets anders. Ja, Lightning Talk. Het is niet alleen. Het is ook open spaces. Open spaces, um, so yes. Dus in de in morgen, um, I mean, er is een board, people can put up whatever gets voted. <laughs> Then it gets uh, uh, allocated to rooms, uh, and then uh, we, we create a. We all make mm-hmm. like round chairs, a uh, circle of chairs, sorry, uh, to sit around and talk about it. Yeah. And then the person who suggests the topic doesn't show up, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but then you have moderators that try to lead it. So that's right. The most popular topic this year was women in DevOps. Oh, sorry, last year was women oh. in DevOps. So that was quite, quite a crowd attractor. So, folks, Any other questions? questions? Okay, we have a shy audience. Uh, please, please hang around. Uh, the organizers will also be here. Uh, so, who's going to submit uh, a talk at Genius Conf this year? Nobody likes to raise their hands. As a, as a mere organizer, you should know their pattern by now. I really know your pattern. I know it. It's power box days. I think, don't leave me for trying. <laughs> No, any any conference. Any conference. Or meetup. No, you just have to think about it, and then you on set in your brain secretly think, can you? Don't have to tell us. Ah, uh, you, you go okay, home secretly. Ah, okay. uh, can. Oh, perfect, okay. perfect. Hi guys. Um, how will you engage with a boring audience? What will you do? <laughs> As you <laughs> always. Very meta. Very meta. Yeah. How will you engage with? Uh, oh, basically. Um, Okay, not a lot of Malay speakers here. There is a phrase in uh, Malaysians who like to use. It's called "siok sendiri." Uh, "Siok" means uh, "siok," and then "sendiri" means "self." I think uh, at the end of the day, if the audience is not very responsive, i.e., yourselves, um, <laughs> you and then the interaction, you can either provoke a response, or or I think you. You, you, I think you, are, you sort of have to understand like where, where the audience is coming from. Like, for me, I'm local, so I also understand like you ask me to raise my hand, and then that sort of thing. Any of me, not not that, but even single okay guys, both yeah, both good. But I like different audiences really react very differently. I'll, I'll share an experience. So I'm very used. I started up uh, here locally in Singapore, so like I would ask myself rhetorical questions, then answer my own question, like get, go on my talk and get on my life, and then it was very it was very normal. Uh, I got a chance to give a talk uh, overseas, um, somewhere else. And uh, when I ran through the talk with the organizer, he was like, can you make your talk more interactive? I was like, what do you mean? So, so uh, you have to like pepper in some audience interaction. So uh, what, what was very different is the audience was very responsive. And um, so I was like, oh, you, you ask kind of very like superficial, very lame questions. Like, oh, so how many of you think you're a developer? This only like oh, half the room, like, whoa. And I'm like, wow. It's like, I did not expect this. Like, like you're very awake. awake. Like, yeah. And so again, different. Uh, I think sometimes you don't expect too much, if, especially if you, I think for us, right, it's beneficial that we come from a place where the audience, audiences are generally more reserved. Because I've had uh, friends uh, who are from like America, where they're very used to a bit more audience interaction, have given me feedback that they felt very unnerved when they spoke in Singapore for the first time because they're like, I don't know if the audience likes me. And it was like, silence. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 they're, they're like that one. They, they really love you, but inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I think for us, right, it's an advantage that, that you, you might get even surprised that like there's audience feedback, but genuine. Generally, uh, when I went to uh, the Philippines, uh, the audience was a lot more warm. So it was quite, for me, it was quite a very uh, rewarding experience because uh, I did a talk about CNS, but um, one of the things that I do is that I must sneak in Beyonce somehow. Somehow she must show up somewhere. And it turns out, <laughs> Beyonce is really big in Manila. So there were some, this bunch of jokers at the end, at the back of the room, who were like, at the end of the like standing ovation, they're like, oh, queen! And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, I, okay, you have a lot of energy. So, so it was quite a nice experience, but I think, I think it, it's all right. I think every audience is, is different. And as long as not, not more than 50% are like, oh, I think it will be fine. Yeah, like, there will always be this one guy, I, I've had an experience that this one guy sitting right in front of me, sleeping. <laughs> just right, like, just there, they never give faith, just sleep. But everyone else is fine, so I'm like, yeah, maybe you're tired. <laughs> so I'm like, he's fine. So, so you, you sort of, you, 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 you adapt to the, to the audience. You don't have to have a very excited audience all the time. 
Because you know, by yourself, you keep your feelings inside, <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> oh, okay, cool, yay. Okay, so I'm not really sure how this whole speaker thing works, but every time after you do like a conference, how do you guys get feedback on your talks? What's your talk question? Uh, yeah, so for us it's still a work in progress. So the, what we did last year, actually we asked people to fill out the form and we collected all the feedbacks and we only share like general comments with the speaker himself or herself, but not with everyone. So that's how we do it. And we talk to people, you know. So, because people are very polite when you ask them for feedback. So sometimes it's hard to say that's really what they think of that. So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of complaints about the food, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is very common in Singapore because you have such a diversity of people, so it's hard to please everyone. The food uh, is good. I don't know. <laughs> it makes sense. Come on. That was our biggest complaint from people was the food. So, <laughs> so uh, and apart from that, yeah, that, that's how we try to improve. We just try to collect general feedback from people. We ask around, and that's how we know. Uh, of course, as conferences, or conference organizers, we all have sponsors as well. So we always have feedback from sponsors after the event. We ask them how it was, and because we have a lot of agile coaches in our organization as well, we have a lot of retrospectives and that kind of stuff after the event. So that's how we do it. One way you could ask for feedback is to actually ask for feedback. Yeah, in your slide, your closing slide, you have ways that people to contact you, like your Twitter, your Twitter handle, usually, you know, the uh, Twitter handle or email, or <laughs> even things like, uh, I don't know, okay, you have, the more extreme case would be to have a Google form somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then you can, but one way, one, one, one implicit way you can get uh, feedback is to actually post a link to your slides. Uh, if your slide is on like speaker deck or slide share, people can actually add comments to, to, to it, which is kind of nice. And when the videos come out uh, on YouTube, YouTube it's on comments. Yeah, YouTube comments. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> it's, very, it's a bit indirect, as in, you know, it's a bit two, three times removed, as in, they're not physically there. But you still get some interesting comments. Not always good. Interesting but is because yes. the yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, so um, we'll be open to uh, receiving comments and feedback, uh, like with the Twitter handle or something, or like some. Maybe sharing email may be a bit not so good because then you get spam or email. You know, yeah. that you do like the forwarding one. Ah, okay, so those kind. Okay, okay, and you know, up to you. Uh, yeah. Is there a question back there? Uh, I was wondering, right, for the top topic, right? Is it? Must, I mean, usually for conferences, must the top topics be on something that you already are familiar with or maybe something that you just came into recently? Like example, uh, if you are freshly, how you got into your essay, uh, DevOps or UX? You already mentioned it that it's okay, right? So like, reiterate your point. Yeah, well, attention. it's okay. Uh, for me, initially, I thought it was okay for meetups, definitely. For conferences, um, it depends, right? If you do the CFP, definitely highlight that this is my user, you know, my, my uh, story of how I got into it, and, uh, and then it's up to the like, organizer. But sometimes that works, yeah. Um, yeah, but for meetups, for sure. I mean, um, yeah. I, mean, I was thinking about something earlier about the conference. Yeah, so um, we, we, we looked at a lot of CFPs last year. And I think I had two other evaluators with me looking through every single submission. And I think one of the comments that one of my evaluators said, that, oh, this guy is like just reading off everything from the, from the documentation. That, that kind of thing you really don't want to do. You really want to really uh, share about your personal experience or your actual experience working on something or doing something, some insights you have on, on something. You have, as, as, as if it's closer to you, as in you, you actually use it at work, is actually more relevant and it's more impactful as in people who listen to you say oh okay you have gone through that you know, you know about how this thing work or don't work and you're sharing your personal experience I think that's something really uh, something you don't get from just reading documentation so one of the things that uh, uh, one thing about conferences is that the topics you can 
find almost anywhere. You can use go to YouTube, find Google for like Kubernetes or yeah. Docker or Spring Boot. You find tons and tons of videos out there. So what makes it different? What what makes it the what? How do you make yourself? How do you differentiate yourselves? Is in your personal experience and what you inject into the subject matter. It's not just what you read from documentation, but what you have experienced personally. I think that's that's more impactful. And especially for someone who's who are totally new to this or totally new to uh, that legal knowledge, sometimes we having a fresh pair of eyes on the topic is actually better. In a sense, you can look at it from a different. Like I, I, in, like in the last iOS uh, conf uh, that was just a few weeks ago, um, there was a speaker who came up talk who talked about uh, refactoring and how we should organize this code and everything. I was like watching it like, wait, these are all like textbook, textbook uh, refactoring techniques that he talked about, but he presented it in a different way. As in, like, he used an analogy of uh, of, uh, of, a, of somebody as a, as, a, as a reporter in a newsroom. How would you organize your, your, your so he uses, because he came, he came from a media background, he was a radio DJ before. So the, the, the way he looked at the subject matter of refactoring code and everything, um, he brought along with him his, his background of a media person and how he could relate all that to, and it made, it made the subject matter more lively and more relatable. Um, which is very interesting, I think, yeah. Um, I think what, even if you are completely new to a particular topic, right, the fact that you're going to explain it in front of a lot of people will force you to think about things you never thought before. You could use it every day, but until you are forced to explain it first to yourself and then to an audience, then you'll realise that there are a lot of things that you have to go and find out. And, and that's one of the advantages of, of trying to give a talk on any particular topic. Even if that's a topic, that's something that you use every day. Be, um, it, yeah, it could, be, it could be refactoring or anything, but if you, when you're doing it, and then you're trying to verbalize and try to explain it to someone who does not have your context, that in itself, that whole process is of value. Because it, it forces you to think about the, the why, not just the how, but the why. Because now you have to explain what you did. And normally you do, you don't really care, as long as it works, pass, move on to the next thing. But the moment you are forced to articulate, right, you end up going a lot more into the whys than you would uh, in a day-to-day -day setting. So, so uh, yeah. I hope that's relevant. I don't know if it is. It's like all neat, like all over the place, really. But you know, whatever. I mean, to give you an example of what I used to do when I started out, like I started out, uh, I was doing something else, and I started. I wanted to learn more about Docker back in 2014, right? And so. Docker had these uh, releases like every three months or something, very hard to keep up. So uh, when they do a release, actually I was usually playing with release candidate. The release candidate had change logs, right? So the change log, um, they, they do a really long bullet list of all the changes and it's a, usually a very short description. But then usually they link to, and this is mostly with open source, right? They link to the pull requests that are linked, that, yeah. that those change requests come from. You go through those pull requests and you see whole discussions, like even links back to uh, why the previous uh, suggestion was closed. And you see, and definitely those open source projects, you see people from Google, Microsoft, and Red Hat, whatever, they're all communicating with each other. We tried this at Google before, it didn't work, we, got, we saw these problems. And just reading through those, a change log of a release candidate and all the pull requests. And then by the time I could see it was estimated to be released around, around that time, I would schedule a meetup and then I would talk about it. And I would have the ability to say like, this is the introduce this change because this is what they saw happening before. And that just gives yourself so much more uh, background on, 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 on the software. And, uh, and yeah, that, that just that helped me just focus on it. And okay. it was interesting to be. Yeah. So, not just for open source software like Docker, even web specifications like <coughs> CSS, uh, that also happens. So, if you show up tomorrow uh, at Talk CSS <laughs> happening at SP Digital, uh, what we have is we have uh, every month, because no one else wants to do it, I will do it, I will talk about the, the updates and changes to the specifications. Whether or not browsers themselves implement this uh, is another thing, eventually you will get there, but the specifications themselves, it's an open process. And most people don't bother with this, but it's actually quite interesting to see the discussions they go through because specifications are standards that all browsers have to uh, agree, uh, agree to implement. So there's a lot of discussion before actually uh, is set. Like, okay, we agree and this is a standard. There's a lot, like there's months worth of discussion. It's quite interesting. 
because they have to think a, a, about a lot of different age cases that most normal users won't encounter, but they will always be, you always have to take care of age cases when you're doing something like standards. So the whole discussion, I mean, if one day you are very bored, you're not even doing your weekend, you finish binging all your Netflix, you can go and read these uh, discussions. It sometimes is quite entertaining because it's, it's a conversation. Yeah, just just. Thank you so much, everyone. This this was a fun panel. Uh, we we've run out of time, but please do please do hang around uh, and speak to these amazing organizers and amazing speakers. Get more tips if you're looking for topics, um, understanding what you could do, what you could speak at. If you want to interested in. Uh, uh, Attending, volunteering at any of these conferences, please do reach out to them. Um, I'm looking at my speaker notes. <laughs> um, I wanted to say, um, conference speaking is hard. It's it's not easy. Um, but at Women Who Code, uh, we all band together and do things together. I mean, I banded with Rain this year to uh, to summit CFPs. So if you're looking for a partner of crime, do reach out to us. Uh, we'll be available. Like we, uh, you come come along to any of Women Who Code events. Um, just just reach out to us and we help you figure a partner out. All right. So um, thank you, engineers SG, for recording this event. Uh, so is online, I'll be shared on our Facebook group. Um, our next event is on Angular 7, so if you're a web JS person like me, um, so it's happening on the 21st of Feb. So, thanks for coming. Right,